Welcome to The Extra Dimension. This episode is part of a mini-series about transportation, largely inspired by a series of articles on Vox.com. Today, Brian Mitchell, Ian R. Buck, and Ryan Rampersad will talk about the future of transportation. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED17. Now, I have to admit, the series of articles was not the original, original inspiration for this series, uh, but it provided a lot of the materials for the other episodes. The true inspiration for this series that really got me thinking about transportation, uh, and especially the future, was when during Google I.O. 2014 or something like that, maybe 2015, when they interviewed Sundar Pichai, and he was talking about the problem of cars sitting for 90% of their lives, not being used, right? Yep. And so he was envisioning like transportation as a service where developing self-driven cars would allow the cars to actually be active for a greater portion of their life because they could drop one person off and then that person's not going to need another car for another few hours until they need to go somewhere. So that individual car could just go and pick up somebody else who needs it right now. Uh, and that means that we don't have to have nearly as many cars in existence, right? And um, and, you know, so the, the benefits kind of trickle down there. Uh, and that really, that concept really captured me and got me thinking about this whole thing. And I was like, I really want to do an episode about that. But then I began to realize that, like, that's the future of transportation. We need to do all the other types of transportation as they currently are. So that's why we've had, like, this whole long mini series that's taken the greater part of a year to finish. Well, here we are. We've made it. Yes, this is the final you episode. You might say that we've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> it's been you a long journey. Destination. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to go and listen to the other episodes in this mini series, we did one on cycling, we did one on public transportation, we did one on cars, and we did one on long distance transportation. Planes, trains, and, and boats. boats. Yep. That was a fun one. So, yeah, so the, the self driven cars are going to be the biggest thing in the near future in the U.S. especially because we already have all of the infrastructure built, you know, around the assumption that everybody's driving. Yeah, the car's already there, mm -hmm. and suburb suburban areas are already designed for early cars. Yeah, so. yeah. And so, like, the self-driven car has the most potential to easily change our patterns of transportation without having to restructure everything yeah. immediately. I think it's the, the cheapest, easiest to implement solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so let's talk about some of the implications of using this this cars as a service concept. So first off, anytime that you need to go anywhere, you're just going to like summon a ride. You know, you're not going to have you're not going to hop in your own car and drive yourself from where you're going to. And that's that's why Tesla has called the the summon feature in their newer newer oh, models. Yeah. So you can you can be somewhere and just summon your car. And so you know the, the idea is. I think Musk even said that it could be across the country. Somebody, it would, it would eventually find its way to you. <laughs> <laughs> Might take a couple of days, but well, it, it that would imply that it can automatically stop and charge. Which I don't Why think they, I don't think they have uh, robot superchargers or anything out. They released that video of the the robotic charging, which is interesting to see. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think they've really released or deployed that anywhere. I'm envisioning a like a, a heart warming movie about a tesla Aww. traveling across the country <laughs> trying to find its owner oh i would still watch that uh, no, i think the superchargers the superchargers i think they're going to start charging mm -hmm. you to use them as a charger for your car i think they were giving out some credits that's how they're going to stop some credit of using superchargers so they will no, will no longer be free oh okay i think shortly like, like the, the stations ago. that tesla itself has set yeah. up kind of thing but okay, you yeah. know tesla has their own proprietary chargers so mm -hmm. the superchargers were only for tesla cars and i think I hope that I don't know if we'll talk about this later. I don't know if this is in the notes, but a common charging format. I think every other brand uses a common charger, and mm. Tesla uses their own. Well, aren't they just the Apple of the car world? Oh yes, they are. 
Uh, Until they introduce four ports on their car. (laughs) (laughs) So in addition to being able to just have a car whenever you need it and not have a car when you don't need it, you can also have the exact type of car that you're going to need for a specific situation, right? So if I am doing my daily commute, I could have, you know, a, a smaller car that's going to just transport myself. If I am going on a trip out to the corn maze with a bunch of friends, mm-hmm. we can, you know, tell it this is how many passengers there's going to be on this trip and it'll send us like a van or something like and that. And it can also do carpooling. So maybe it saves you a little bit of money mm-hmm. if it picks up someone along the way that's mostly along your route. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. Uber does something like this, only it's human drivers, not yeah. mechanical drivers. And you can... and. You could also view it as kind of like uh, paying a premium if you absolutely want to be by yourself on your daily commute kind of thing, right? Yeah. We can also improve efficiency of the system overall by taking a look at uh, what the big patterns are of, of usage, you know, of demand, um, and, and deploying the fleet accordingly um, at certain times of the day. And you can probably imagine that, y- that you might get like uh, a discount if you schedule like this is going I, I'm going to have this consistent schedule of daily commutes. So yeah. send me so a thing every it can, yeah. the the hive that will be the auto or the self driving car system will mm-hmm. will know how to optimize that. And I think yeah. eventually also if if we do get to a point sorry, when we get to a point where every car is self driving, especially in cities, mm-hmm. I think traffic will be a less of a problem because Theoretically, at that point, self-driving will be good enough where cars can go the same speed and people can you know, merge in seamlessly without needing to right. slow down or speed up themselves as well as the cars behind them because that's how traffic jams start. And I think that will really be a changing situation or, or idea for, yeah. for traffic because I think a lot of you know people – traffic is a big hindrance in living farther away. So people can change how they're living and work, work patterns and mm-hmm. transportation. Although if you think about like the – we addressed this in the car episode where we said that adding more road infrastructure, you know, the more capacity on our roads doesn't alleviate traffic. It just yeah. means that people are but going I mean, to be using it more and it's the, the traffic is going to eventually but I mean, be It's the not same. necessarily changing the road. It's the, the fact that self-driving cars mm-hmm. could theoretically drive more efficiently in terms of using their right. space. And but, but I can imagine that the same rule will apply where like, yeah, it's more efficient, but that's just going to mean that people are going to be more willing to take more trips and so then more yeah, trips are right. happening on the road. Yeah. And so then, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a maximum capacity of cars per space on the road mm-hmm. and there's no escaping that. Yeah. And I think, you know, there, there'll still be a limit because cars need to refuel and or recharge. They need so, to watch out for children crossing the street. They need to so they will have a range, pedestrians. You know, if you're... There will always be things that slow traffic down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, unless... So you mentioned pedestrians. Um, I've, I've seen some proposals where it'll, it'll be ideal for us to have roads that are dedicated to self-driven cars because then the self-driven cars can be at their maximum potential, right? They don't have to worry about pedestrians possibly getting in their way. They don't have to worry about cyclists messing things up. Um, and so that, so then the only things that the self-driven cars have to worry about are other self-driven cars. Mm -hmm. And if they all communicate with each other, then they can coordinate. And, you know, when everything in a system is coordinated, it can be as streamlined as possible. And so one one of the links that we have here actually shows a video of what an intersection might look in the, look like in the future, where it wouldn't even need stoplights. Just like crazy cars crossing each other. Yeah, yeah. Because as like, so it looks like a traditional cro- uh, intersection, but instead of like the cars stopping and queuing up and waiting for their turn to go through, they all just communicate together. Uh, and they all kind of slot themselves into an an open spot in there, and so they all like they they kind of have to slow down as they approach the intersection, but none of them ever have to really stop. They mm-hmm. they just continue through. I wonder is because I know there are studies of roundabouts versus a traditional intersection. Mm-hmm. At least for human drivers, roundabouts are a lot more efficient in terms of number of cars in the intersection at one time. Right. And I wonder if self-driving cars could also benefit from that or not because i know like possibly because yeah. i think part of the reason why that is so appealing that kind of an illustration of all these cars in the intersection is because it's so hectic and crazy that humans can never do that because it's mm-hmm. just so such high speeds and close proximity to other fast-moving giant heavy metal objects and so it's like perfect to illustrate look how great computers are but i think like i, I, I just feel like a roundabout it would be more more efficient and yeah. safer probably um for a roundabout i think it reduces the number of, of spots where collisions can occur, for sure. But if there isn't that danger of collisions anymore, because, you know, the computer is, is coordinating them all, 
um, than having all of the the cars have to go around a curve, whether they're eventually going to be going straight or turning. I think that is less efficient because then you're losing speed to the fact that you are doing a curve. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you said they're going to slow down anyway, I don't know. Yeah, and, but and, I, mean, I don't know I exactly how much they're going to slow down. It's easier for a current self-driving car to do a roundabout than a high-speed yeah, thing probably. like that. So I think that's maybe down the road, but I would see. <laughs> that was a, well a very accidental pun. <laughs> I think we've had a few of those over the course of this miniseries. Yeah. So, also, parking is going to be a thing of the past. I mean, obviously, the cars will have to stop at some point to recharge. And, you know, when, when we're not at peak capacity on the roads, some of them are going to be parked. But you won't have to park them, right? That's the where the big frustration And I think that's going to hit us before even self-driving cars are super prevalent, prevalent mm-hmm. for this summoning mm-hmm. thing. It's like, the yeah, the car is its own ballet. cars have been able to, to nice. self-parallel park... For almost five, yeah. five or six years yeah. now, like it's mm-hmm. been a while. I don't know what cars were first to do that, but yeah. and not only is it nice that you don't have to worry about like the the intricate uh, maneuver of parallel parking, but you also don't have to spend time driving around trying to find a spot to park in, right? You so, you take your car to like the, the, the drop off zone, get mm-hmm. out, say all right, park, and then you know when you're done with your meeting or whatever, or your work or whatever your school, you just as you're on your way out to say summon, and then by the time you're downstairs, it. May or, let, may or may not be there mm-hmm. pretty soon or wait when you're there. So let's say the car goes and parks down the street. It's winter though and it snowed. Does it have to brush itself off? Oh, that's a good question. Ooh, yeah, because that could obstruct the cameras. I don't know. I feel like a lot of these cars are developed in California and I think winters <laughs> are just kind of ignored. I, I, I remember reading a thing a couple years ago about how Google self-driving cars weren't ready for prime time because of rain and, and snow just obstructing the radar and it really really shortened the distance it could see to Mm -hmm. the point where it probably wasn't safe anymore to be fair i've driven in heavy rain when it definitely was not safe for me to be driving but i did it anyway yeah me too i I drive all the time in on five when it's raining and going 60 it's Mm -hmm. great (laughs) that's terrifying Mm -hmm. all right transportation will also be much easier for the very young and very old we addressed this in our individual car ownership episode that it's a great system of transportation Unless you're somebody who cannot legally drive. Right. Um, and so th- having self-driven cars all over the place will solve that problem, hands down. Yeah. It's also going to be much easier for people to do- get stuff done during their commute, right? So that's not going to be just lost time where, you- where you're doing nothing but concentrating on driving yourself to... So the benefits of public transportation are, are here. Yep. Having more mm-hmm. time and being more efficient. Mm-hmm. And you-, you might even get more than just public transportation. So like if you're on a train, you know, you might have an outlet maybe if you're lucky. But on, like on a bus, you'll never have an outlet to plug your laptop in. But in your car, you might have that. Right. Yeah. Though they'd probably charge more because it uses more more power or anything. Oh, that. sure. It's yeah. fine. It's a dollar. It's well, yeah. I'm ooh, a dollar to charge my phone. That's actually quite a lot. Not your phone, your laptop. Oh, okay. Yeah. Built-in Wi-Fi in the car. I mean, if I... It, it, it if it's summoning itself, apparently it must have some network connection. Yeah. Did you know that the Green Line has Wi-Fi? What? I was just on the Green Line today, and I had Wi-Fi the whole time that Is I was that there. New? I don't know. I guess. I've never, I know I've the, never noticed it before. The, the A-Line also has Wi-Fi on the buses. What? Nice. I've not used it. I'm nice. like, eh. I've never on it long enough to really justify connecting <laughs> to it. I just like, I'll just use LTE. Hmm. So I, uh, speaking of, of public transportation, um, we actually addressed this in that episode as well, that self-driven car systems uh, could be definitely used to augment like large capacity, longer distance public transit lines as the kind of, you know, the, the uh, door to transit, uh, you know, the, the, the very beginning and the very end of, of the leg of the journey. So the public transit is in the middle and you just take a little self-driving to your job from the station or to yep. your house to the station? Yep, yep. Okay. Um, instead of having to wait at the station for another line to take you out to, you know, wherever your, yeah. your final destination is. Unfortunately, of course, the more efficient that we make transportation, the easier urban sprawl is going to be to to exist uh, because it's going to be easier and easier to live far away from from where you work and you know you you can't reasonably ask people to live really close to where they work just because it's more efficient you know because if you if you make transportation efficient they're going to live wherever the heck they want to i would i would say yes but still people don't want to sit commuting hour and a half every day I mean, while they can, even if they can be productive, it's still 
worse than being able to have an extra hour at home mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. on each end every day. Mm-hmm. You know, you could you'd still have to get up really early if you have to commute an hour and a half to your job. You know, versus if you live closer, you could sleep in later or do something else in the morning. Like there's right. just so but you think about um, the fact that there's like a certain percentage of the population that is already willing to have an hour and a half commute, right? And if the hour and a half commute currently in 2016 is 40 miles away, I'm just that's a completely you know guessed number. Yeah. If in five years it takes an hour and a half to go 80 miles, then that person who's willing to have an hour and a half commute that expands their radius of oh, where yeah, they can I live. See. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good good point, and I think that's wonderful, in fact. Um, you know, you could live out on a nice piece of land out in the country somewhere, but you could have your regular job in the city if you wanted. Mm-hmm. But what what happens when everybody else wants to have their nice piece of land out in the country as well? Then we just have the suburbs expanding out into the countryside, which is what we're seeing, yeah, you know, that's it, fine. especially in the Twin Cities. I see no problem with that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I mean, I, I really, really like the... European cities that are very, very dense and concentrated in the center of the city, and they and they haven't seen this urban sprawl happen nearly think, as much as in America. So I think two things will happen there. There will be more incentive to have more things. We talked about it in one of these episodes where we wanted to have little centers of common things all over the place. Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah, walkable so, neighborhoods. Right. right, and so there will be some of that. But there will also just be more people living in more space, Mm -hmm. and that's fine. Mm -hmm. All right, so next let's talk about, we we just talked about how cars will will transform our habits and, and kind of our urban areas. Let's talk next about how cars will look different in and of themselves uh, once we have, like, pretty much all of the cars on the road are are self-driven and they're all electric-powered, right? So, bottom line is electric cars can take almost any form that you can imagine uh, because they don't have to have, you know, the strict, like, engine block connected to an axle connected to the wheels and et cetera, et cetera. They just need, like, four things. They need the wheels, they need a platform for batteries and passengers, they need a user interface, and they need wires to connect everything together. Other than those four requirements, it can take whatever form you can imagine. Um, especially when you consider that, like, the user interface doesn't have to be, like, a touch screen or, you know, a dashboard or anything. It could be entirely voice controlled. It could be, you know, your smartphone connecting to it and just, um, you know, Google casting to the right. car. <laughs> um, <laughs> So electric cars also convert a higher percentage of energy to movement, um, 60% of the energy versus 20% of the energy for internal combustion engines. That's good. And so, so yeah, like, especially when, when they're self-driven and you don't need an interface for the human to directly control the car while it's in motion, you don't have to have, like, the driver's seat facing forward anymore. You don't have to have this big windshield on one side and, you know, and the, and the like, flat sides and stuff. You can make it into other shapes. Like Imagining you- those, like, drawings from, like, the 50s or 60s where there's a, a cheering, happy family sitting around a circle table in the yeah. car yeah, playing yeah. some board game with a open gl- – or a, a, a sunroof that's, you know, yeah. like light in the front and it's, you know – it could totally be yeah. like um, seating in a in a train, yeah, mm-hmm. where you have like four seats facing towards the middle, um, and they, you know, it's it's kind of communal, right? Yeah. yeah. And I've heard some people saying like, "Oh man, that wouldn't be good for my motion sickness." And uh, it's like, okay, so just claim one of the back seats that's facing forward, right? Right. Yeah, that is, that is a thing, and I, I I don't know anybody other than my grandmother who gets motion sickness still, because mm. to me that's that's a a figment of the old world. Like, uh, I think Savannah. I does. do. I do sometimes if. If I'm reading something or if I'm concentrating mm-hmm. a lot, sometimes if I'm a long car ride and I'm programming something on my laptop, I, I, I can't do that. It's better when I'm further in the front of the, in the, of the car. So if I'm in the front seat or the middle, it's better. If I'm in the back seat of the minivan and doing it for some reason, that's just mm. – that, that makes it a lot harder to concentrate on something. How about in the, how about in the back of a school bus? Right? Where the, the very back where it's the motion is the most. It's been a while since I've, <laughs> since I've been in one. I, I think I sat farther up in front as I got older though. Mm. And the back was more of the – like the mid the mid level students who thought they were really cool, <laughs> yeah. And then the the seniors just sat wherever, not caring at all. Mm-hmm. That was that was me at least. Um, also consider that accidents will be far less common when 
all of the cars are self-driven cars um, because currently the way that we engineer cars uh, they have to be like built as heavy as possible in order to be safe right because if they collide with another one of these cars they both have to be like armored against each other in order to uh, protect the passengers inside Mm -hmm. so if if we can safely make the assumption that accidents are not going to occur that you're not going to be colliding with another car at, at 120 miles an hour then you can build these cars to be much lighter much smaller and then you're you're carrying around less weight so you it's actually even more efficient than we mentioned earlier and i think that that kind of evolution of car design will take you know a good 15 years oh i think i think it'll take a long time because there are a lot of external factors that can help or they can worsen things and i think self-driving car technology and the the machine learning and things that'll go into that. It's gonna take a long time to mature to the level where you can have a driver that that or someone in the car that's not driving or mm-hmm. a complete autonomous car that I mean Tesla showed a demo of it, but I think it's gonna be a while and especially until until human drivers are off the road, right. I think yeah. nothing's really gonna change. And I think People that's gonna, gonna to, take the longest is getting all the human cars off and the road. What I think is gonna it's gonna take is until it is made illegal to drive a car in a city on a mm-hmm. highway or something. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it'll be driving around with, you know, manually will be more of a hobby, you know, like, like racing might be, or, you know, um, like a BMX, but you might go to a course to drive around right. a little bit, or you go to a, a zone that is human driving only or something. Mm-hmm. And you need a, a special license for that you know, driver's license, I guess, and where you wouldn't need something for a self-driving car. Yeah. It's like going to the shooting range. Yeah, sort of like exactly. that. To shoot the gun that it's legal to have but not legal to use in most places. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and I like I like that equivalence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think there are going to be a lot of people who are like, no, I like my car. I can't do this. Yeah. And I also really wonder what – I mean, we're, we're all thinking from urban areas. But I think in Definitely. rural areas, it's going to be a lot different. I, I think there's going to be a lot of resistance to self-driving cars because it's a lot – I mean, I think just the it, culture on cars is a lot different. Well, and it's going to be impossible to effectively set up a system that is like, I summon a car. Oh, the nearest one is a 15-minute drive away. You know, so so then I have to wait for it to come to me, and I have to wait for to get to where I'm going, you know. I mean, um, maybe, but I feel like there will be, like, I don't know where, if it's going to be 15 minutes away, I mean, you would just say, like, I want a car to get me here at this point in the day. And then it, the network will just figure it out, right? Well, but I mean, what if I'm being spontaneous? Like, I suddenly go like, well, then you hey, let's wait. go see a movie. I mean, you'd have to wait. And if you weren't driving yourself, you'd still have to wait. Well, that's what we're saying is like the, the driving yourself habit, that, that pattern of living right. is going to stick around much, much longer in rural areas. Maybe. I'm uh, also wondering, you know, things like... Those people know. who had to be spontaneous in the middle of nowhere, it would have taken them forever to get it wherever they're going anyway. Now, what about things like a non-traditional transportation, like a cement truck going to a construction site and then having to back in and pour concrete, things like that, like semi-trailers, that's going to be autonomous, I think, especially for Definitely. a highway, and that's going to come out before passenger. I think that's that's already going to be deployed. Like, I think um, in the next decade, we'll have autonomous self-driving trucks, maybe long haul, be a driver. Long-haul trucking. Um, now, and then there's farm equipment as well that mm-hmm. is self-driving. You know, you just sit in a tractor to your thumbs while it drives up and down or it drives straight ahead. You just have to do the turns. Yes. And it'll, it'll be mm. when it's getting done. And that's, that's already in place. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just wanted this specialized machinery, like where I worked in Morris, the parent company was an environmental company and they had this giant drill truck um, that, you know, had this massive drill in the back, you know, mm-hmm. driving that around sure on the highway, but at some point you're going to have to switch over. So the cars are going to have to have manual control for these specialized cases. And I'm just curious you know, do you have to have both self-driving and manual? Like, how how that's going to be regulated and enforced? Yeah. So, what about something like a like a police car or a fire truck? Like, how does that work? Ooh, that's a good question too. Well, isn't the purpose of a police car to transport a police officer to a place? Yeah, I know. But what if they had to get somewhere really fast? Do they have the ability to throw cars and... off the road? <laughs> well, I think if they're all self-driving, the self-driving cars can go ahead to get to the side. Mm-hmm. They can still go in one lane with the assumption that no no car is going to move over, and this car just zips by in the left lane or something mm-hmm. and i think you know then everything could be on you know self-driving even the police and fire truck sure. until it gets it gets to you know the site and then it can say switching over to manual driving and you switch over mm-hmm. to do the more fine-tuned things but i think we're going to be in an interesting situation as this transitions over between manual and self-driving and i don't think a lot of stuff can really 100 percent work effectively until it is completely self-driving right but i think i don't 
I don't see like even maybe in my lifetime it getting to that point. I think we'll have a lot of self driving, but I still think it's there's going to be people who do manual manual drive as well. Especially when you consider the fact that the average uh age of a car on the road has increased over time because Mm -hmm. cars last longer you know it's going to take a while for people to you know everybody's current cars to break down and no longer be usable and you know people aren't going to go and sell their car just to get you know get a self-driven car first or completely abandon owning a car right away you know we're in an ideal situation because you and i don't own cars currently we, I will be probably within a month or two. Oh, man, Brian. I, I don't own a car. Pra- I'm going to be ready for the Ian, future. <laughs> Ian, I have to work in Eden Prairie. I can't yeah, borrow my parents' true. car every day. So yeah. I think, Eventually. I think um, so on, on a podcast we all technically should listen to, John Syracuse made a good point about typing on keyboards. So the the new MacBook Pros have really weird keyboards. They have the new butterfly switch. And nobody likes that. Uh-huh. Generation 2, though, they apparently have a little more resistance. A little bit more, but it, they're still awful. And, of course, they added the new touch bar. And so the, the, the genesis of these products will be there'll be a screen on the top and a screen on the bottom, and you just type against glass. But then all of the hipster typists that exist now will hate that. Oh, yeah. It's physically atrocious to them. And maybe we just have to wait for all of us to die off until <laughs> the the next generation just says, eh, don't care. I'm used to typing in glass. It's no problem. Well, eventually, I mean, I, I won't mean, have to type at all. I'll just think it and I'll maybe, input text. Maybe. I don't know about that, though. Embedded computing. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I won't be embedded. It'll be integrated. So I think there will be a lot of things like that for this kind of car stuff. We just have to wait for it to become... Re- the, we just have to wait for no resistance to be there and we'll just do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, consider like uh, kids who are growing up now who are going to be turning 16 in the in the 2020s. They probably won't – a much lower percentage of them will have their driver's licenses. Well, I think people in, in cities teens. are it, – it's going down for people growing Definitely. up in urban areas. Suburbs, I think, are still high. But mm-hmm. cities, it's it's going down. Yeah. But like, yeah, if, if this self-driven car as a surface system is there – by the time that they are, you know, of age to have a driver's license, I bet you that a much lower percentage of them will have it. I think so Uber when, is changing a lot. So what what mm-hmm. generation do we think that'll be? So like, I think people now will still most people. I think it's. It, I think it's going to take. I think we're going to still a decade or two between or from now and when it's very mainstream. I think we'll start mm-hmm. seeing trickles of of some self driving things, but I I still think we're a little far out. I think it's. Far rapidly coming coming up, but it's not quite at our you know it's not it's quite not like, on the doorstep like next year yeah yeah it's not at the curbside. <laughs> Let's also talk about security because security is going to be a big issue when you have all of this data being collected because th- this system is only going to work if it collects a lot of data on everybody right uh, on all on our overall habits as a metro area but also for like each individual user if it wants to predict when a particular person is going to want a ride even before they have decided that they're going to go out for a movie tonight you know kind of thing then it, then it has to store individual data as well uh and so you, even if this like the entity that owns all this data is totally benign uh and we trust them completely we don't you, by the way well yeah we probably wouldn't we also have to make sure that they have the best security possible because that's going to be a huge target for other people to attack and try and get that data right um you can bet that uh you know if google's in charge of this there's going to be targeted advertising based on your travel habits right sure um because that's how google works and i think there's a lot of questions about how this will work i think there's a lot of questions about how there will what 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 entities will be involved in this system Mm mm-hmm whether it'll be a single unified central effort or well, whether it will be a secure distributed network of cars interacting with a sort of mesh network that's mm-hmm. just spontaneously made and never much bigger than the radius around the car. I think there's a lot of questions like that. And it's very important that we work on those. I think having it being distributed is probably the most robust and mm-hmm. easy to scale system. I guess it's kind of falls in the same line. I also think that... It needs to be a lot different than how the Internet of Things has has been rolled out. There's Internet of Things is famously known for being very insecure and 
if the recent uh, and not intercompatible. Ser- yeah, and the the recent denial, denial of service attacks were from botnets of like hundreds of thousands of Internet of Thing toasters and cameras and things that have default password sets. And so I think companies need to. I think there needs to be other uh, like a consortium of standards that are enforced or or legally enforced by governments and things. You know, there needs to be a lot of collaboration between everyone. Mm-hmm. And, this, uh, and so it's going to be a challenge. A, a question that that comes up from this kind of thing is when you have all of these self-driving cars. That so let's just say we skip the the, the transition time and we're just at the <laughs> we're just we're just at the point where there's just self-driving cars and we can summon them. Like you know, mm-hmm. we don't own them anymore. We just summon them. We pay for them when we need them. Yep. Who makes all those cars? Yeah. Who who it's... paid for all of them? They're is there be, one you know, manufacturer or are there like five and they just all happen to interrupt? And will, and will they have all different services? You have one app for your, your Lexus right. cars, one app for your Toyota yeah. ones, one for right. your Honda ones. And- In my ideal world, and I don't blame other people for disagreeing with me on this, it would be the municipality, right? So in our area, we would have the um, whoever's in charge of Metro Transit. I can't remember what they're called. Metropolitan yeah. Council. That's yeah. the one. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they they would run the self-driven car fleet as for well for this area. For this area. So yep. what if we want to take our self-driving car, you know, to Chicago? Well, you wouldn't be doing that, would you? You would be getting onto a train and going because that is long distance travel, or I mean, the Hyperloop because you know, three hundred and fifty miles. That's what in the prime. Like, like Northfield. I know. I was in an Uber earlier this summer and met some guy who drove some couple to Northfield and then, mm-hmm. you know, which is outside the MSP area and then drove back, you know, the, I think that the, did people, he have a return rider? Nope. No. Okay. I think that the couple maybe paid him more or not, but he like, I don't know. It was a longer trip as well. So we did get paid more for it, but mm-hmm. it's still like, yeah, but yeah. it didn't return. It didn't pay for the return trip. right? No, cause yeah. it wasn't a taxi where taxis do both. If you go outside mm-hmm. of their zone, you have to pay for the return as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of problems with that kind of thing, and that will have to be worked out separately from the tech. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Now, uh, back to the security question, I think there's a lot of technical details that we could explore, but we won't, about how the system actually is implemented. Um, and and a lot of it depends on what ends up happening in terms of companies making systems and hardware. Yeah, and th- there was a an interview that I read with the current director of the... the the Bureau of Transportation, the whatever uh, it's called at the federal level. Uh, and he was talking about um, that. The Department of Transportation. That's Department the one. Yeah. Department, Department, Department of Transportation. There, yes. Uh, so he, he was talking about how it's very, very important for them to encourage all of these different manufacturers to build in systems to interact and, and share data with each other. In a similar way that airlines share a lot of data with each other anonymously. Um, so, for example, like he was talking about, if a one self-driven car drives over a pothole in a particular area, it can notify like not only the Department of Transportation in that area, if, you know, let them know, hey, you should come out and fix this, um, but also notify all of the other cars that are going to be driving over that spot so that they know to, you know, veer two feet to the left to and avoid they that. They could pothole. drop a little notification for that <laughs> geo coordinate <laughs> right. on some on, on ways, system. Right. And, then... and so I, I think I like that. But what I don't like is there being like a centralized network that they all just adhere to. Like it just tells all the cars at once. Yeah. Here's a thing. Don't go here. Yeah. I, right? th- I think that, yeah. and because I want just a localized mesh networks so that if a car becomes compromised in one location, they don't all freak out. Mm. Right. And, and so there's, there's a lot of that risk taking that we have to, but if we have like this mesh network, so this, this hypothetical car just went over this hypothetical pothole, but then it keeps driving, right? It, 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 gets miles and miles away. Yeah. And then the other cars that are now going over that spot, they don't know about it because yep. they, you know, that car hasn't been able to talk to them. I think a hybrid that. solution might be good. And that's where I think like governments or, or big committee, you know, consortiums of, of all the key players can come in where you have like a centralized notification system where you can alert things on traffic incident, you know, um, it'd be like, um, route there, changing there's a, th- a technology that Apple, um, sort of talked about in one of their keynotes where, they will um, do something to uh, data that they're getting from their users, but they'll anonymize it and they'll sort of make random entries out of the data they're collecting. And so it'll be like, is there a pothole here? True, 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 false, true, 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 false, 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 true. And over time, because it actually is happening and it's not just fake data, that there will be more trues than falses. And so 
no individual card will be reporting for any individual thing, but as it happens, it will just become true for that spot. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that technology is called, but something like that would be necessary because we don't want to be reporting, you know, we don't want an individual person in an individual car to be responsible or to even be known where it was or what it did. Mm. All right. Uh, Police departments would definitely disagree with you on that. Yeah, they want to know where everything is. And we, we don't want that. And we don't want. They want to know where everybody is. Yeah, we don't want that. So, like, what happens in a uh, high speed car chase? <laughs> How are you going to have a high speed car chase at this point? Yeah, they'll right? both be going at each other <laughs> in parallel. High speed at like fifty five. How hour. will you use this system for illegal activities? Yeah. How will you? You use an old car that you drive it on a road when it shouldn't be there. Yeah, probably. I, that 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 actually sounds really appealing to me. That like the idea that it will be much much harder to perform illegal activities. What's an illegal activity? Tr- transporting things that you shouldn't be transporting. How will it know? Going, well, <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Do they have weed sniffers in the car? If, well, well, I mean, <laughs> like if they trace it back to the user, they can. There's probably some way to to track for just for like payments and things. Mm-hmm. What person was in what car at what time? And yeah, that's, and that's probably. Some yeah. way of tracking, you know, so if you took, if you're kidnapping someone, you brought them along and, and you say, yeah. oh, this person drove from St. Paul to L.A. this day. That looks a little suspicious. Mm-hmm. This person's probably in L.A. now. You're mm-hmm. going to need a, a car proxy. If you, yeah, if you notice a bunch of cars driving to a particular warehouse, you know, and it's like, well, that warehouse isn't being used. That's suspicious. For like any, yeah. Yeah, mm. I, I feel like a lot of that takes a lot, a lot of those um, perceived liberties away. Yeah, yep. Uh, not a huge fan. That's a, yeah. That's an interesting aspect that I hadn't thought of before. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting. Oh, I probably should have mentioned this one when we when you guys were talking about trucks, about semi trucks, and and you know stuff like that. We're going to be able to see a lot more thing like efficiencies there, where like. Uh, trucks will be able to drive like one right behind another mm-hmm. and reduce drag for for you know the the group as a whole. Especially uh, if they can communicate saying, "I'm going to need a stop in fifty, forty, thirty, ten, twelve, mm-hmm. or twelve, ten, ninety, you know, yeah. how many feet?" So then they can all stop together because you know that's that's kind of how how traffic jams happen, where someone slows down a little bit more aggressively than they should, mm-hmm. the person behind them slows down a little more, and then you just have this group responding just a little bit delayed, and where if they can all talk to each other, saying, "Oh." They can they can all go oh crap this person up like a mile ahead is stopping really fast then everyone's like oh crap they all can stop simultaneously yep and yep we will also see self driven features in things other than cars and trucks you know so like uh, we'll see more self driven features in boats and trains and planes I wouldn't be I think I mean like the autopilot in planes and boats uh-huh. have already you know they're already they've been self driving for a long time. You know, it's like the landing, it's it's landing and docking that probably isn't. But I think, I mean, a lot of it is already self-done today. You know, I've never thought about what it must take to dock a cruise ship before. But wow, that sounds like a process. Absolutely. And of course, the, these cases are ones where these are all things where currently the vehicles are driven by somebody as a profession. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so as those professions become obsolete, we're going to see a transition, a very tough transition in the labor force where these people don't, you know, can't feasibly do the job that they have been doing for a really long time. And will have to find other sorts of jobs, right. which is not something that people take kindly to. No. So like, uh, not even just outside of the, um, you know, long haul trucker kind of job. Mm-hmm. Well, what about UPS drivers? What about FedEx drivers? Mm-hmm. You know, of course, the taxi drivers already hate Uber. Yeah, um, I mean, so there's there's tons of business that involves people delivering things outside of even you know typical, like what happens to all the people who deliver Domino's pizza. Yeah, yeah. I mean, are are you going to need a person to carry the pizza from the car up to the doorstep, or is, is the app just going to notify you that like, yeah. hey, there's a self driven car waiting outside. Go grab your pizza before somebody else does. Or or maybe they'll just charge an extra five dollars if you really want the hand delivery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That'll that would be a good that, way to get money. Actually, yeah. That's interesting. yeah this is, I think there's a, a, a going to be an absurd number of people. Um, I've seen the number of truck drivers. I think it's at three and a half million. It's well, like and, it's and, the most common like job from like right 
over half of the states. And then that's just yeah. that's and, just and truck only, drivers directly. That's at, not all the support staff. Yeah, and not only like most common, but most consistent yeah. job across the board has been truck driving. Uh, and so when which I think is a bit more unique to the United States. I think there's more yeah done yeah. by trucks, or it's more is done by rail. No, more is done by rail in the U.S. and in, in Europe and other places. Actually, even though truck driving is very common, right? Yeah, because the U.S. is larger and can benefit from yeah. rail. So there will be there will be a lot of um, very displeased individuals. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and and when I looked at one of those types of maps that was showing like what the most common job was over time, they they cited reasons like why truck driving has been so consistent. It's like it it's one of those few jobs that hasn't been a victim of either globalization or automation. Mm-hmm. And I read that and went, <laughs> not yet, it's coming. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it's really just too bad because the people who that kicks out of the workforce, what else are they going to do? Mm-hmm. Right. It's not like they're going, you know, like in the in the you know the the silly dream that oh well the automated thing has replaced my job, but now I can get a job repairing the automated thing. You know, like that's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, you you will not be looking at the source code. You will not be going in to fix its um, lithium ion battery. There's nothing you can do. It'll just be scrapped, and you'll get a new one. Like there's nothing repaired about anything anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And the, yeah, these transitions are always hard, and they always come with social upheaval. And uh, this is th- yeah, this is probably going to be one of the biggest ones that we've seen in recent times. Right. So, wh- which one do you think will happen first? Will will kick people out of driving in the cities, or will fix the system so that people who are kicked out of long haul driving will have something to do? I think they'll be kicked out first. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's capitalism. There's, there's no <laughs> there's no feeling for social for societal gains in today's world, at least in the United States, I don't think. Right. Yeah, and and I think that's where we've uh, seen recent news uh, that that a lot of the motivation behind the election this this November was that a lot of people were displeased by their jobs that they had been doing are on the decline, and so they, you know, Donald Trump promised them the opportunity to keep jobs here and you know to to get their old lives back essentially sure and so a lot of people went for that i think yeah i think that's going to be really tough when there just is an economic reason to not even have jobs here or anywhere there won't need to be a job Mm -hmm. it'll just be a thing that does yeah All right, let's move on to safety as related to self-driven cars. This is actually a topic that uh, is near and dear to my heart because, shameless self-promotion, my senior seminar was on infotainment uh, interfaces in automobiles. So, so the, the studies that I looked at were all about trying to design some sort of interface inside a vehicle that will allow the driver to control their, you know, their music playing, their navigation and stuff like that uh, without being distracted. And the takeaway of, of my senior seminar was you really can't can't design a system that will do that for a person because if their if their brain is occupied thinking about what the next song is that they're going to want to play or you know what they're going to want to add to their navigation route uh, they're not paying as much attention to the road so yeah i i think um i don't know humans can't really multi- multi- no no like i don't know in your experience when you're driving down the road and then you, you realize that you're like a mile away from where you just remembered you were and you know you're driving just fine there was no problems but you just are suddenly so much further than you thought. And you I, right. just, I'm, I just freak myself. I'm like, this is horrible. Why? Like, I know. I, like, like, it might not even be. I'm, I'm just like thinking about like daydreaming yeah. about something. I'm like, geez, I just like feel like I wasn't paying attention at all. Yeah. Like, maybe I look at my speedometer or look at my mirrors. Oh, well, yeah. I know but... I'm looking. I know I'm perfectly safe. But I just realized mm-hmm. suddenly I'm just a mile Especially from where like, I was. Like, I'll sometimes, you know, go visit a friend out in like, I don't know, Plymouth or something. And, and, this doesn't happen too often, but like I'll drive home at like midnight or one a.m. Mm-hmm. and then I'll just suddenly be home. Like, wow, I was driving for thirty-five minutes. I'm home. I'd... Wow, where did that time go? Where did go? Mm-hmm. Especially if I'm listening to podcasts, I'll just like be paying attention, but just focusing a lot on listening. And and so the reason I bring that up is because in normal driving, you know, you're supposed to be watching the road and stuff, 
and the infotainment aspect of things. You know, you're listening to a podcast, you're listening to the radio, or, you know, even worse, you're texting somebody or you're calling somebody. Don't do that, by the way. Watch out for cars. You know, like, I'm just sitting there driving and I'm thinking about coding and it's awful. I need to stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, full disclosure, I absolutely hate the word infotainment. Know, and it was the too. first word in my title of my senior seminar. I think that's kind of the idea. Like, you have to write about the things you hate. <laughs> Uh, excellent. So I think, you know, if it's self-driven car, you can focus on infotainment without being worried about safety. Right, yes. I mean, you can focus on anything, right? Mm -hmm. That's the idea. You can okay. sleep. Sounds the great. The possibilities oh, man. are endless. If I could get up and then just sleep in the drive to Eden Prairie from St. Paul every day, oh, it'd be great. Oh, yeah. Oh, that would be a great design for a car is like the sleeper car where you <laughs> just, just got like a bed in there. Yeah. Why not? Excellent. I mean, you just order any kind of car you want. Uh, so here's a really interesting question. When it comes to self-driven cars and safety, how do we decide a self-driven car's response to ethically dubious scenarios? Mm -hmm. uh, there's that there's that classic image of the train car going and the guy at the lever. Do you yep. kill yep. one? What, what is it? Do you kill one person and the whole? No. So shoot. so the trolley remember. is going trolley. towards five people, and if you do nothing, it'll hit them and kill them. Uh, you have a lever that you can switch to divert the trolley onto another track that only has one person and so if it's either you know is is inaction and allow other people to yeah. die uh better or is taking an active part in the in the situation and killing one person better. and then of course you have the variations where that one person's either the president president or your mother and i took some some tests online and i was i answered it with few i i valued greater number of people as higher and i valued if it was a tie, I valued doing nothing higher. Mm. And if there are animals involved, I valued humans higher than animals. What if and it was so, the president? Yeah. How do you? How do you... I, 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 more, I strictly went on number of people. Right. If it was a tie, then I did nothing. Now, yeah. Animals the, weren't, weren't, didn't the, count. The video that we have linked here in the show notes, I highly recommend that everybody go and watch it because it covers um, all of this quite nicely. And uh, yeah, so, so not only do we have to decide what is ethically right because obviously we don't have a law that says like what you should right. do in that situation and, and i and i don't know that we have a a consensus culturally on which one of those options no. is correct so so and then also like if you're driving a car and it kills everyone inside but no one else else or do you value the people inside more than external people mm -hmm. well, well they are another. paying customers aren't they yeah but <laughs> But if you can save 300 people's lives but kill the four inside, what would you do? Mm -hmm. Like, right. it's And I think and even another question is if there's multiple vendors of these cars and there's multiple systems involved, what if there's different morality systems? Is that what we're calling them? You can them? pay it's more our... to value yourself other other people's lives. Right. Like, it's it's going to be tricky. It's just it's a <laughs> it's a slippery slope. Uh-huh. Um and and so like it's a completely different path than than trying to teach humans about morality right because most of the time when a human is involved in like a car accident situation you don't have time to consider the moral implications of what you're doing you just are are, are reacting instinctively mm -hmm. to what's going on around you generally saving yourself yeah but like a self-driven car will have a heck of a lot more time processor cycle wise to figure out exactly what all of the different possibilities are what all the different options are and what the outcomes are likely to be it'll in. also have a lot more time to despair over that decision yeah right a depressed computer so you can't just program a car to follow the laws because as we said like the laws don't cover all possible scenarios and laws are meant to be broken and well <laughs> in america and sometimes laws go contrary to what would be morally right in a situation yeah. mm -hmm. sometimes it's we safer to veer off the road and mm -hmm. drive off the road right and so are there going to be special variations of this kind of thing so you know a pedestrian car pedestrian car a regular person's <laughs> car you know uh, it, it has some programming that says, yeah, keep keep the most number of people alive no matter what. But then, um, you know, like there's the uh, there's the like armored truck car that needs to protect the money at all costs. And then there's the uh, radioactive waste car 
that needs to make sure that the radioactive waste never leaks out ever at all. I can imagine that the president's car, the president's bulletproof car, would have different programming than the rest of ours. Right, and right? of course, and then the, the person who programmed the car, are they uh, Republican or Democrat, <laughs> or are they from China? I mean, you just can't win. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And, and so when a car you know does something that that might you know that would be wrong uh who's at fault is it the programmer is it the company that manufactured it is it the owner of the car that's another question that we have to come to terms with i mean will the person who owns the car be able to see the source code and know ahead of time what the car will do in any given situation and if they don't how can they ethically live with that choice it was probably in the eula that they clicked agree on i thought that was in the terms of service sure yeah (laughs) so then also how do we how do we teach a car what is right and wrong because you, you can't program and you can't hard code every single situation right um so one the the likely way that we will do this is uh given that we actually have neural networks now that can learn stuff effectively they can learn by example right so you get a, a board of ethicists together and they all uh you you, you present them a situation and they together oh you know, it'll probably take them that's, a while that's gonna but be very they tricky decide. because you know there's there's been networks that have been trained to learn things about um criminal activities and things and they've become they've become racially biased because mm. he, you know the general law system has been racially biased against people of color and so the p- machines have picked up on that and just they're just following the same example that's given to them but that becomes biased and so it's really hard to get that unbiased completely separate right, right. without just you know void you know providing no context of who the people are it's just like just you know like too much information can make it biased where you know mm-hmm. limiting how much it has available so like uh this decision making that the cars have to do is that a part of the network so like if a car knows that it's going to hit somebody does it tell the other car yeah i'm gonna hit you and somebody inside might not make it yeah because then that latency would uh right. probably then, uh, introduce a lot of yeah right and so the latency factor there you know like accessing stuff outside of your computer is orders and orders of magnitude slower so it might not even work out you might not ever get to communicate outside before something terrible happens Mm -hmm. you just can't win uh one scenario that uh, i found fascinating that they presented in the video was let's say your car is careening down a a road towards a couple of motorcyclists and and nobody has time to self-driving motorcycles (laughs) right uh to to like fully get out of the way right one of the motorcyclists is wearing a helmet. One of them is not. Which one do you hit? You know, if, if the person the, without the helmet, because they they should be they should have been wearing one. Well, they're not legally obligated no. to wear one, right? Um, and be. and of course, Decker when 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 presented this, he was like, "Yeah, that idiot deserves to get hit." And I was like, "What in the world? You're, de- you're like so you're valuing one human life over another just because you don't agree with the decision that they made?" But I think humans are biased too because uh, there's been studies that show bicyclists who bike with helmets and and lights and you know they're more protected Mm -hmm. cars will be more aggressive and drive closer and more dangerous really because i would drive further away from them i like them they did they did it right but uh, apparently there's some study that shows that people will drive closer to bikers that have helmets because they're not as worried about killing them or something yeah and and so yeah so like if if one of the humans has an 80 percent chance of surviving but the other has a 20 percent chance of surviving then you know who do you choose if you if you choose to hit the person with a helmet because they're more likely to survive then it oh, overall it becomes safer not to wear a helmet right because then the self-driven cars are le- are going yeah, to avoid hitting a, you yeah unless you're all unless you're surrounded by a bunch of people with helmets well, <laughs> Just have a well, bunch of no. bodyguards with helmets <laughs> riding around you. <laughs> well, what if what if one of the people, uh, what if the guy in the middle is a uh, is the president riding a motorcycle? Though, if you're, <laughs> but if you're on a bike or a motorcycle, you still can fall. You know, you can lean hard enough in one direction and crash the bike. And then mm-hmm. in that case, it would be nice to have a helmet on. Mm-hmm. So it's not completely driver based. It's you know, right? A bike will fall over if you do nothing long enough. <laughs> where a car will True. just stop moving. It won't fall over. <laughs> so, so obviously, this topic is is a minefield of moral dilemmas just everywhere, right? Yes. And it's... there's no real right answer. And I don't, I, I don't think we'll ever come up with the actual perfect implementation ever. And I think there will just be terrible things that happen, and it's just going to be a, kind of an oh well kind of thing. It'll just yeah. be tweaked and changed throughout as people come up with better situations. You right. know, I think there'll be a lot of, I think, you know, there could be a place for a lot of 
philosophers to come by and try and chime in and there might be but i don't think that's going to work because there will be no unified agreement and it doesn't matter unless someone makes something so truly groundbreaking yeah but that's, eh. I, I just don't see that happening i don't think yeah, that's a solvable so, thing either. just we're, on the other side of things we're also at risk of self-driven cars doing so the bottom line is that we have to make self-driven cars make less errors than humans right, right. but also the the differences in the way that we perceive things and the way that the self-driven cars perceive things and process things means that they're going to make mistakes in very different ways mm-hmm. than we will right because like the sensors are going to be fooled into uh you know the object recognition is going to be fooled into thinking that one, that like a, a trash bag is a human right um, or sometimes that somebody sticker of a tree on the back of their car they actually think it's a tree and they try to avoid it. Yeah. Oh, gosh. That would be um, horrible. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, like, we're going to see cars making very different mistakes than humans would. And hopefully, they'll still be less fatal mistakes than humans would make. Right. And I, and I feel like the mistakes that the self-driving cars will make, if, if they're programmed to, to, you know, to minimize harm, right? Like, just in general, the mistakes that cars make... Um, will end up being just inconveniencing mistakes like oh i had to i had to go down this route because i had no other choice Mm -hmm. right like there just there wasn't enough time to go down this lane so i had to go down this road and sorry too bad yeah we'll make a u-turn at the Mm -hmm. earliest possible uh, opportunity Mm -hmm. So that's it for self-driving cars. Let's talk about our other two forms of transportation that we have listed here. This might be a little more far-fetched. Yeah, I think these ones are definitely farther out in the timeline. Though, though they both claim that they will be ready within five years from now. Yeah, I feel like these, like, so the, okay. The, so the second one on the list for sure. <laughs> okay, so let's talk, uh, about, let's talk about the first so one first. Little, yeah. So flying cars. We're not long, really long dream for decades and decades and decades. Yeah. I don't, if I don't remember when I first read about these in like Popular Science magazine, right? Like it's, years ago. Mm-hmm. So we're not talking about like fly, cars that drive on the road and then like you know sprout propellers and start flying. Um, these are uh, mul- like multiple rotor electronic or electrically powered aircraft that fly at about 150 miles an hour um, over, like, not terribly long distances, right? And uh, so Uber wants to offer an on-demand service that uses them within five years. Uh, it'll be very similar to their current car one. Actually, I can imagine them just rolling that into their app uh, as, you know, another option. Like, okay, I want to get from the center of the city out to whatever suburb I'm going to. Mm-hmm. I don't want to take a car. I'm going to take, uh, you know, one of the flying dealies. Um, actually, I think the, the service is going to be called Uber Elevate. The really interesting thing about this this concept is that we don't have to worry about infrastructure, really. They just they just need to build the vehicles because there there's already lots of helipads around, especially in the U.S. There's like 6,000 of them, apparently. Yeah, but that, I mean, that's like a couple per city. That means you, you fly from airport to airport. Like, helipads are on the rooftops of, hospi- of hospitals mm-hmm. and in airports. Maybe mm. police stations. That's like I don't think I ever see a helipad anywhere in the Twin Cities in my daily life, like ever. Yeah, but we're so never like high enough up to see the helipads, right? Yeah, but there, there's just no. I don't think there's built-in infrastructure for landing. If they're vertical descent, sure there can be. You just take a parking lot or something. But mm-hmm. it when you start getting towards aviation, then you have to deal. I think there's a lot more. There, it's more closely regulated, and yes. you have to worry about. Um, no fly zones. You can't. You wouldn't be able to fly close to a major airport because you have planes taking on and off. Yeah, that's their are... glide. That's a glide zone. Yeah. yeah, and so I think it's. I don't see this being very realistic. I I I mean, you know, com- the consumer drones are already being regulated and, and clamped <laughs> down. I don't think. I just don't see this really being realistic. Mm-hmm. Electric aircraft. There's. I saw. I've seen one prototype of an electric helicopter, and they could. Uh, it was. Lighter, the engine was lighter because it was an electric engine versus mm-hmm. internal combustion, which is a lot heavier and denser. But the batteries still added more weight to the helicopter. It can only fly for 20 minutes, I think. Okay. And so electric uh, aircraft are still very far from being mm-hmm. um, 
a reality. I don't think this will happen even in decades. Yeah, I think they were talking about like there's there's new composite materials that are coming out from Boeing that will be necessary for this technology to work. But yeah, the the one that I think is the biggest hurdle is the the legislature, the the regulation side and being allowed to fly where they need to fly. Yeah, and then work. if they're, you know, if they're a hybrid plane car, they're just they're atrocious. They're they're not going to be good at flying or at driving. Oh yeah, no, we're not talking about that at and all. And then then you still have your fly stop transfer, you know, then you're going to have because it's a plane that can fly and hit more areas, you're going to still have TSA is going to get involved. I just, it's just, I just don't see it really being that useful. Oh yeah. Like I think, I think, I, I think you know, it, its target area would be within a large metropolitan area, right? Mm-hmm. You know, from one suburb to another. Mm-hmm. I think trains are just as good. They're a little slower, maybe, but they're you can run them more frequently. They're more efficient. Mm-hmm. You don't have to have as many of them. You just add another train car in the end, and you're you can carry fifty, sixty more people versus you need to, you know add 60 more planes to carry more i just i just flying cars is one of those things that i think everyone would like to see but i i don't think it's feasible in an environmentally sound nor regulatory simple way and well said technology is there sorry i'm bashing down on this but so speaking of speaking of trains and and situations where trains work better than flight the hyperloop is uh kind of a a fairly well-known idea that is currently being worked on announced in 2013 by elon musk another one of his deals yeah uh so this one was actually um the the original like proposed uh design of it was it involved both uh people from spacex and from tesla Mm -hmm. uh working on the document so it's it's a proposed solution for high-speed travel between cities with large traffic uh, that are less than 900 miles apart um, because uh, at, at more than 900 miles, supersonic aircraft become more, uh, more efficient um, from, it, from it like a time perspective, I think. So it would consist of a tube with a rail inside it and air pressure inside is kept very low, um, though they, they, they're not trying to make it into a vacuum because that would cause other problems. So pods would travel through this tube at subsonic speeds. It's been described, this is my favorite phrase ever, as a, as a cross between a Concorde, a railgun, and an air hockey table. That is quite a comparison. Yeah. <laughs> so the, I think it's the Concorde because it, it goes very, very fast, um, probably partially the propulsion system as well, right? A railgun. Uh, well, because of its propulsion system. Yeah, probably. Yeah, magnetic. The- Mm-hmm. Thanks. Uh, and an air hockey table because of how it stays above the rails, right? Um, so they're not using mag lift because that's very expensive. They're they're using uh, air cushions that uh, that keep the the pod off of physically off of the rail. Yeah. So yeah, they announced the concept in 2013 and started a competition for independent teams to design and build hyperloop pods because like the. Building the the tube itself and the rails is fairly trivial, right? Well, at least for the design perspective, right? Uh, so build, uh, designing the pods is, is the where most of the work is. So the big event uh, will take place on a test track near SpaceX headquarters in January of 2017. So that's actually coming up real soon here, guys. Yeah, um, we'll keep an eye out for it. Yeah, so we'll probably have to talk about that later on whatever news podcast we want <laughs> to do. We've also seen uh, interest from, well, we've seen a lot of different proposed routes, right? You know, so uh, L.A. to San Francisco yep. is the one that Elon Musk was originally talking about. Um, we've seen uh, Montreal to Toronto, the two largest cities in uh, Canada. Um, and apparently the, the highway between those two cities is like the most heavily trafficked one in, the, in North America. Mm. Um, so that would be a good route. I, of course, looked up how far apart uh, Chicago and Minneapolis are. We're right in the sweet spot, uh, though I suspect that the traffic in between those is not heavy enough for, you know, we're not going to be one of the first routes for a hyperloop. You can have a stop for Madison. Possibly, yeah. Although you, you really, it has to be about as straight as possible. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> you curve and it, yeah, it's friction and that's. Well, more it's damage. It's it's more uh, concern of the g forces that are going to be put on yeah. the passengers as you turn. Yeah, that's true. Uh, however, Dubai has been talking to I think Hyperloop One, which is one of the companies that's been working on uh, this technology, um, about the possibility of having a route between Dubai and Abu Dhabi, um, which would be a great test area for it because that's a very straight. 
uh, and it goes like across a desert, so there aren't any yeah. like landmarks. I saw a a YouTube demo video just a couple of days ago. I don't. I was looking for a link that I have, but I don't know where it is. Um, but they did a, a demo of someone like in a meeting saying, "Oh, I need to get there in, in 30 minutes." Goes down to the Hyperloop station and hops on his own individual pod, and then it joins into a couple other pods onto a train, and then it sips along, and he gets out, and it's, it's this pod he gets in that you can drive on the road, go into the Hyperloop train, move in the train, mm-hmm. and so it's all in one. It, I just thought, I'm like, ah, it looks so nice. I, I don't see it. It's so expensive to build something like that, and, and I, I think it's going to become, you know, each. It's not going to be one universal standard. I think it's going to be adapted and modified for every installation Mm -hmm. and so it's not gonna quite be the one universal system for all i think it's gonna be they are open sourcing like pretty much everything that's being worked on yeah but i i still think it's a lot cheaper both for passengers and for construction to just build standard rail and i think i think ultimately yes it's more convenient for speed but i think realistically people are gonna they're gonna go with the it works but it's four times cheaper option i mean maintaining hyperloop with uh, you know, fiberglass or glass or plastic, whatever this is made of, keeping a, a tube is a tube that is at a vacuum that needs to hold a vacuum seal, not a complete vacuum, but lower pressure. So it has to hold the seal. The compressors it needs to have periodically down the, the length of the tube to keep it at this at this pressure. It, it's much more expensive than laying down um, rail. So, so actually, the, the, the original reason that uh elon musk started like formulating this and talking about it was because uh the proposal for the high-speed rail line between la and san francisco would be much more expensive and much much slower than uh than than what elon musk believes the hyperloop will cost and and part of that reason is because like the hyperloop is designed to be pylons up in the air so you don't have to buy all of the land in between Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, and and you don't need that, like, you know, um, tw- 20 foot wide, 100 foot wide, however <laughs> wide it is, yeah. you know, swath uh, for the rails. The the farmland in between just has to deal with, like, okay, so there, there are these pylons in the middle of the field now. And, and they've dealt with that kind of thing already with, like, you know, telephone poles and whatnot. You also don't worry. You don't have to worry about, like, animals uh, accidentally getting onto the tracks. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, that could bring costs down a lot. Mm-hmm. It's also- just it's just more structurally complicated. So it yeah. Though yeah. I mean, a, p- a lot of the reason why rail is, is tricky and expensive too is you have to prepare the land and lay down concrete and mm-hmm. and ties frequently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. Then I guess. And he was talking about I guess especially since this is California earthquakes uh, that the the pylons could have you know a certain amount of leeway built into them um, that they can shift in vertically and and side to side to to make it more resistant to earthquakes and and weather than uh uh than a rail would be mm-hmm. um I, I don't know. i'm just i'm a little doubtful of how successful and prevalent this will be i think time will tell but well the, yeah well uh january might be uh, a good time to tune in and and see what's yeah, going well, on i'll definitely follow it but i'm just curious and the the really interesting thing about it is that like uh when you first hear about it you might think like okay so we're talking like a pneumatic tube but Pneumatic tubes work by having almost a seal between the item itself and the edges of the of the tube, right? Uh, and then it's being pushed by air behind it. But they're they're doing almost the opposite of that, right? They're they're evacuating uh, enough air from from the tube itself uh, to reduce friction, and then they're accelerating it with. I think it was magnets in the rail, like at the like at the beginning of the ride, it accelerates it. Uh, and then the fan that's built into the fan and the compressor that are built into the pod itself aren't to aren't there to uh, accelerate the pod. They're actually just there to reduce the pressure buildup on the front of the pod, right? To to bring that uh, allow the essentially allow the air to pass through the pod to the back of the pod. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like only one pod can be moving in this tube at one time. Yeah, you'd probably have two two tubes parallel to each other, one going to San Francisco and one going to L.A. kind of thing. Yeah, and so, you know, you can be a lot denser on rail, but in, yeah. in the sense that you can have train after train after train. I mean, within reason, too. But with a Hyperloop, if they're doing pressure differentials like that, I think it's it, it can be tricky to, I don't know, they'll figure it out. Yeah. We'll they're, see. They're, I'm just they're little, the engineers, I'm just, not I'm just, us. Yeah, I'm still a little doubtful, but we'll see. Hopeful, because I think... New high speed, non non 
plane tra- transportation is super exciting. And I just want to touch very briefly, even though this isn't really realistic, uh, Elon Musk at the latest SpaceX demo for their um, the the BFR stands for Big Effing Rocket, um, their their Mars transport. Mm-hmm. Mentioned, you know, they could in the future, you know, they could drop cargo anywhere in the Earth and within like an hour because they could shoot up into space and then land it wherever you need in the ocean on the, one of their their barges and then mm-hmm. bring it to shore. I don't know if that'll ever really be a thing, but I I think Amazon might be interested. <laughs> Gosh, bulk yeah. orders. It's just the issue there is it's so much rocket fuel and it's going to be so expensive because you really you have to go up a heck of a lot of height. And yeah, you fall into place. Uh, speaking of actually space, they they were talking about the Hyperloop and how it uh, might Im- be implemented on Mars. And because the atmosphere is so much thinner on Mars, you wouldn't even need to build a tube for this thing. You could yeah. just bring the pods, build a rail, and then zoom. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there's nowhere on Mars I need to go. Yes. So, but you don't live on Mars yet, right? But when I do, there's also still going to be nothing on tourism. Mars. Oh look, some sure. sand. Oh look, some other sand. Oh, I'm sure that we're just going to be, have those uh, those nice bike stations, you know, where you you go to Mars and you rent a bike and then you bike from one, you know, oh Wait. atmosphere. Yeah, you can't do just that. do it in a big clunky suits, just like I can just imagine <laughs> a big puffy suit and it's like little little, little tiny little pedals that you're pedaling on and then self driving bikes. So that's about it that we have for transportation of the future because we're limiting ourselves to just looking at near future right we're not going to talk about like teleportation it, teleportation oh, or wish. stargates or anything like that um portals but yeah check back in like 20 years we'll see if we uh if, if things have progressed enough when for us to talk about celebrating it its 25th year anniversary <laughs> oh man a quarter of a century we'll see i'll probably still be around <laughs> I, I hope we're all around still maybe not the nexus but I'm sure. sure if I'm around, it might be around. It, yeah. We'll see. I don't see why not. It's a good brand. So where the can same, we find you guys on the internet? Uh, you can find me on my website at brianm.me. I just wrote an article about Fog of World 2, which will be coming in an upcoming Second Opinion episode. Mm-hmm. And you can also find me on Twitter at underscore Brian Mitchell underscore. And of course, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ranmar. And of course, driving 45 minutes each way daily to and from my office. That'll be me soon, except it'll except 45 will be closer to an hour, hour 15. Yeah. I am Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck and on my website at ianrbuck.com. Uh, we are The Nexus. You can find us on Twitter at thenexus.tv. Whoa. There's no wait dot. <laughs> the Nexus TV. Feel free to give us some feedback there. Also, on our website, reminder, you can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash TED17. While you're there, you could send us feedback directly through our website. There's a little contact form underneath our faces. So if you want to talk about this particular episode, feel free to do that. But also, since this is our variety show, if you have any topics that you would like us to talk about, uh, drop us a line. Or if you want to be on as a guest for something, uh, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Bye. Have a good one. Watch out for cars. Watch out for hyperloops. Hyperloops.